Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. The decision to separate the energy portfolio from that of mineral and petroleum resources has been welcomed, as have the ministerial and deputy ministerial appointments. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss why. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. While there is concern about the size of the GNU cabinet, this separation has received response support. Yes, uh, that's interesting because, you know, raising the number of cabinet ministers to uh, 32 from 30 was always going to come under scrutiny because we've been promised that there was going to be a reduction in the size of cabinet. Obviously, dynamics changed when we had a multi-party government in the form of a government of national unity. And uh, I think I suppose the, the response is, what did you expect? There was going to be uh, sort of a give and take and having more seats around the table made it easier for the president to navigate this uh, potentially treacherous moment in setting up the cabinet, which we know uh, there were the talks nearly collapsed at one stage. So I think that, yes, there is a lot of concern about the size and the expense of cabinet, and there will have to be at some point a whittling down in that executive size, but not right now. But uh, it's interesting that there has been support as well for the separation of uh, the energy portfolio from mineral resources and petroleum. And I think uh, this has been, this was a major misstep of the last administration. It had been diligently separated uh, and there seemed to be progress made on that front. And then under pressure to reduce the size, there was this merger and there was a view that there would be a much more integrated approach to the tra energy transition and to mining because they are interlinked in many ways. You know, coal is still the mainstay of the energy system, but its go role is going to diminish over time. And that needed to be managed and coordinated. And it thought having it all in one department, there would be better coordination. Unfortunately, that was not the case. We got major mixed signals during the sixth administration around energy policy, mining policy, and it really didn't work well. So I think that's why there's uh, the relief that has been expressed that this has now been uh, separated. We're entering a, a, a moment in the energy, electricity, but energy sector in general of high complexity. And there, uh, there is a real potential for missteps and for making decisions of high regret. And I suppose having far more dedication, uh, ministers uh, and a ministerial team and political leadership that has a more dedicated focus on the energy transition, I think is going to be welcomed. But uh, obviously we need to do this in an integrated way, not just with the mining sector, but with a number of sectors that are linked uh, to this energy transition. A big one that comes to mind is obviously our automotive industry and the transition that might have to uh, be taken there or will be needed there towards ele electrification of mobility. But then generally, much more electrification of energy services across the board and it needs to be clean electricity on top of that. What are some of the priorities for the new leadership team? Well, I think uh, there's so many, <laughs> but navigating or shepherding South Africa through the energy transition has to be the overarching sort of priority. But obviously there's a number of burning platforms that have to be dealt with at the same time. Now we know that the, the burning platform of load shedding, uh, I think that's the reward that uh, Ramakhopa has got for his dedicated focus while he was minister in the presidency responsible for electricity and the progress that has been made. We're now over 100 days load shedding free, which is, you know, people say don't praise a fish, fish for swimming. And it is, a, you know, a case of Eskom, this is what it should be doing, but it hasn't been doing, it's been failing. And the fact that we have more st uh, generation stability is a, is a major achievement. And I think, therefore, he's been rewarded for that in this portfolio. But th that, that has to continue. It's not over. We know that the coal fleet is aged and it's unreliable and unpredictable and it needs to be retired. And uh, there's some reprieve there and uh, the questions have to be asked about how those decisions were made. They weren't publicly consulted. Uh, there's been reprieve around some of the older power stations lasting for a little bit longer during to about 2030, which sort of matches with this term uh, of, of this deal political leadership team, so maybe give some breathing space, but we need to really aggressively add new generation capacity, but not just generation capacity, transmission grid capacity, and the new burning platform, the main burning platform now, I think, 
is really this uh, distribution industry. And we haven't got our heads around it. I think we've seen much some progress on generation. We're seeing that there are ways to get uh, over the transmission grid issues and the, um, the market that that um, new national transmission company, which also came into play this week um, and into operation this week, that, that there is more attention and focus about how to get over that log jam in the system, bringing in inter independent transmission projects, uh, have, adding a lot more transformation capacity earlier on in the rollout of the transmission development plan. But we don't see, we don't see the same sort of focus at the distribution uh, end. We know that there is a distribution company in Eskom, which seems fairly stable, but as with the municipal distributors, there's major issues around tariff reform and tariff unbundling that hasn't been done properly. And we see now how it's playing out with these latest city power tariffs, which are being very heavily opposed. And you know, it's coming in a way that really at a time that consumers are under huge stress and uh, this is an added you know, element to the stress of consumers. So it's going to be, I think, resisted. So, but we need tariff reform and we need tariff unbundling. And this is something of a burning platform, I think, for this uh, energy uh, ministry and uh, the new political leadership. So I think that's, that's going to be important. But there's also a huge amount of opportunity if we plan well. And that's where we've really been very poor over the last few years around electricity, but energy planning as a whole. There's a, a legislative requirement for an integrated energy plan. And given that we have this massive once in a generation transition underway, we need to have a, a greater visibility of how all these components fit together. You know, how, how do we sort of bring, bring down the coal component, which you're going to need to do, not, not only because it's no longer the cheapest, but also it's going to put our manufacturing competitiveness at risk if we don't, if we continue producing these, this very dirty electricity input into manufacturing. So we need to understand that where liquid fuels fits in, where gas fits in, um, and try and understand the full energy value chain. Obviously, we don't have a perfect picture, but we need to have some sort of overarching mapping of where we're going so that we don't make decisions and take actions of high regret, which is very, very possible during what is a very disruptive period for, for this period. It's highly complex. Just the electricity sector is a highly complex, uh, um, the, the level of complexity is rising. But across the board, as electrification becomes more of a tool that to do more and more energy services with, and uh, we don't have enough of it as it is in South Africa. But on the other hand, how we transition out of th through this also justly. It's, it's a very, very complicated uh, dynamic. And how we do it so that uh, electricity remains secure in terms of supply and also somewhat affordable because we can see more and more the affordability question coming to the fore. So there are major issues facing this portfolio and uh, it's going, but there are also major opportunities if we manage it well. What are the potential risks facing the new ministry? I think there's so many. I mentioned the burning platform. I think the biggest one has to be the distribution sector. It's highly fractured. Uh, it's the, the tariff structures are not fit for purpose. It's in a, it's in a utility death spiral, you know, that level of the, of the business across the board, whether it's the Eskom having, so, you know, where, it's, where it has direct customers, it has massive debts. Uh, it's non-payment, 70 billion or whether it's the, uh, the Joburg uh, city powers, but even worse at the smaller uh, distribution level, that has to be grasped. Whether it can only be grasped at the electricity department or, or whether it needs to be grasped at an Operation Wullendlele level, I think that's something to be discussed and I think it needs to be knocked up to sort of that, uh, that level. I think it needs to be given high level of attention because it's a big risk as we see also with water supply at the municipal level. But there are also a number of risks, I think, around um, the way governance of the energy sector is going to be play out now with the separation of mineral and petroleum resources. 
it's still a very big part. Uh, the, the coal and liquid fuels and, and gas are, are going to be potentially a big part of this energy or are a big part of this energy system. We're facing a gas cliff on the industrial user's side and that has to be dealt with. And is there going to be less coordination or more coordination you know, when you have a splitting of this? You know, uh, how are we going to manage this is going to be a big thing. What is the role of gas in the electricity system as we have more renewable variable renewable energy, electricity coming into the system, will gas play a role in helping to complement and balance that? So that's, that's going to be coordination there and implementation around you know, liquid fuels and gas is going to be very, very important for this energy portfolio. And the splitting and between two ministries has to be sorted out how they're going to do it. I think a key tool there could be the integrated energy plan, given the overarching vision. But we'll have to see there's definite risk there. And then I think also the, the quick, the very close relationship that Ramak Minister Ramakopa has developed with Eskom. It was necessary while he was electricity minister in the, in the presidency, had to really support Eskom through a very, very treacherous period and get them through and raise morale. I think there's been a number of plaudits for the Eskom leadership and himself in the way they've done that. But there has to be critical distance now. He's the policy maker. <laughs> he can't be the Eskom champion because if he does become the Eskom champion, we're going to see a blurring of the lines between what is in Eskom's corporate interests versus what is in the interest, for instance, of the bigger electricity supply industry and therefore South Africa. You know, what, we need to have affordable tariffs. We need to make sure that th this is done in a way where the, the conflicts of interests are minimised. And that's why it's, it's worrying that we, we, with the closure of the Department of Public enterprises that we don't have certainty around line, uh, the lining, uh, lines of reporting at this stage. We are going to get certainty apparently in the form of a, a government gazette notice soon. But it would be, I think, important that Eskom doesn't report to Minister Ramakhok, but it should re Eskom should be reporting into uh, the, the presidency because that's where this DPE responsibilities are now going to be located during the transition to a holding company and then Eskom must form part of that holding company. It mustn't be something separate and unequal. It needs to go part of that holding company. Otherwise, it makes no sense. The big SOEs need to be formed part of that. And that's not clear either. So I think hopefully when uh, after the cabinet de Kotler next week and after the government gazette notices, there'll be clarity on reporting lines. But I think it is a key risk that R Minister Rahopper doesn't have enough distance between himself at the moment and Eskom. There needs to be that critical. He's the policy maker. He needs to make independent policy decisions, independent at times of what's in the interests of uh, Eskom from a corporate perspective. Thank you. That's the second tag show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.